Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, I think that my testimony here is going to be geared towards uh, instructing you as to my thinking on this bill as well as a number of bills that we'll be hearing on this topic. Um, and I think that the testimony will be uh, more uh, modern than Representative Itzies, uh which I fully support. And I wanted to point out that I, I've read the sections of our historical documents that he mentioned, and I think that uh, he's dead on correct with everything that he said. And, uh, and please do take that into consideration that I'm seconding that. Um, but what's often lost in the debate about health care uh, is that uh, the reason we have a cost at all, um, and I, I guess I'd ask the question, isn't it only fair that the person who receives a good or service in a voluntary exchange should pay for that good or service? Um, you know, health care as it's delivered is a good and service, or service. It could be a cardiac stent, uh, a bone growth stimulator, uh, or, you know, aspirin. And, um, the people who produce these goods or services uh, for healthcare um, spend a lot of time and money uh, coming up with those those procedures and those uh, devices and those medicines, and they deserve to be rewarded uh, in our capitalist system for those what what they produce. Um, for some reason, we've allowed government to step in and pass all kinds of regulations concerning the sale of uh, health care goods and services, even though the government uh, arguably does not have that authority. And I'm referring to the federal government here because I would argue that the state government does have that authority. Um, in the last 68 years, government has created uh, company structures to cover the cost of health care. Health insurance companies have never really been completely autonomous since 1932. Uh, before that, there was about a decade where insurance companies truly operated in a free market and truly provided insurance. And let me explain what I mean by that. When you buy a car and you buy health in, or car insurance, uh, auto insurance, you are paying for the instance where you know a rock comes up and hits your windshield, or you know you get into an accident and something bad happens, so the insurance will cover the instance of that bad occurrence, and, you know, that's what you're paying for. And, and when you buy a house, it's, it's pretty much the same thing. You know, a tree falls on it, you could buy fire insurance in addition to that, and, you know, in the instance that your house burns down, um, you know, flood insurance, things like that. Um, so these, again, are bad occurrences taking place um, in, in the life of you know, the person who owns that insurance, and the insurance will cover that. Health insurance, for some reason, covers well visits. There's nothing wrong at all. Um, you know, and I don't know why health insurance should be any different than home insurance or auto insurance. And, and the truth of the matter is that it wasn't at first. Uh, most people bought health insurance for that odd chance that they might fall down on, on a hike and break a leg or suffer from serious pneumonia or develop cancer, God forbid. Um, and that insurance would then pick up the cost of that rare occurrence that, you know, doesn't, ha doesn't happen for most people who buy insurance. Um, in 1932, government started getting involved with health insurance. Got, Congress gave favors to some insurers over others, which co caused uh, competitive imbalances in the market that have yet to be corrected. Um, and then Congress created incentives for employers to offer health insurance as a benefit, which codified the idea that health insurance is a, a kind of right, which it isn't. Um, with the urging of labor unions, Congress forced employers to start paying for regular doctor's visits and the like, which increased the cost of coverage. And later, Congress created its own health insurance program for senior citizens and those folks arbitrarily deemed to be poor. And as a result of that, Congress started setting prices for some health care services and not others. And even if the government prices were too high or too low when compared to the market price, 
the doctors, hospitals, and suppliers had to accept those prices, which led to adjustments in how they charged for their goods or services to regular payers. Um, government also started to monitor the products that healthcare companies produce, preventing some from reaching the market that would have saved lives, allowing others to reach the market that might have significantly harmed lives. So, in every way, government has taken over the, what was once a free market system for healthcare and turned it into an extremely regula regulated industry as we have today. Um, and I would argue that in every way, government is responsible for the cost increases that stem from an ever increasing regulations that led to this current crisis that we're in. So instead of recognizing the failures and reversing the onerous regulations that have caused health care prices to skyrocket, government has decided to make the American people believe that health care is a right that everyone should have access to, regardless of their willingness to pay for those goods or services. And I, I would ask the question, what incentive does such posturing give drug developers or doctors to continue working? What should a developer spend, why should a developer spend 12 hours away from his kids trying to make the next breakthrough if the government is just going to tell him how much he's going to sell the product for and what kind of profit he can make? Um, why should a doctor spend 12 years in school studying for a job that pays a meager wage not much higher than the unskilled laborer who doesn't attend college a day in his life? I guess the point I'm making is that goods and services cost money to produce and the people who produce them simply deserve to be paid for the work. And the current health care and health insurance industry, as it's regulated, is no longer providing much of an opportunity for health professionals, and that needs to change. I'm arguing that this law that's before you today is the first step in fixing that process. Uh, many of the other laws that are before our committee right now will also be steps and tools in the tool chest that will help us fix that process. And I think that the state of New Hampshire can become what America once was, that shining beacon on a hill that will um, the, the rest of the country can look to as an example of how to do this the right way. And I'm urging uh, us as a committee to work towards that goal by addressing all of these uh, bills before our committee positively, including this one. And I have... Um, this was something that I originally wrote for the Republican Liberty Caucus of New Hampshire uh, pro bono back when the campaign was going on. Um, but uh, I, I figured it was relevant to this discussion today, and I, I brought copies for everybody to take home with them. So, And then I have one that has a little bit more detail from the actual Republican Liberty Caucus report. So I'll give that to the clerk. Um, you mentioned that all, all the providers ought to be paid. You didn't say how much, I assume, as much as they charge. What would you propose to do for those who can't work, who can't afford any medical care? I mean, I don't think that's the question before us right now. I, I, do, I don't think that uh, they would be able to charge whatever they want to answer your direct question, because I think that a free market would set the prices at what people were willing to pay for the services and what the providers were willing to provide them for. Well, um, the second part of my question, how would you propose to provide any medical services or dental services to anyone who realistically couldn't pay. I mean, not that they're choosing not to pay, that they can't pay. I mean, I, I don't think that's the subject of the bill before us, but I won't dodge your question. I'll, I'll answer it. I think that um, it's the state's responsibility to um, d determine what safety net is appropriate for that state. And I think that local communities can make that same determination as to whether they want to create a safety net in their community. And it's up to the people of the communities and the states to decide whether they want that safety net or not. Um, I think that private charity can also provide a great deal of that care, and it does um, to some extent now, but probably not to the extent that it would if people were not taxed to death and they had more of their own money to spend on things like charity and, uh, and whatnot. Uh, 
thank you, and thank you for uh, having this and, and your testimony. Um, you were talking uh, basically about uh, capitalism and, and how that works, um, and why would anybody want, if they weren't properly reimbursed, if you will, for uh, not only the skills, uh, but the products they brought, the life-saving products, uh, uh, pharmaceuticals and so on that they brought. But isn't that the choice of the, uh, the person who wants to work in the system? Well, of course. And, and so isn't that where the price comes from? If, if, for example, I was a doctor and I wanted two hundred thousand dollars, and I'm willing to work for a hundred thousand or ninety thousand, isn't that appropriate for me to make that choice if I were that particular person? I, I mean, I, yes, <laughs> but um, I, I think what you're seeing, if you you've been reading the papers and and uh, following this issue closely, like I have, is a number of doctors are um, going to retire once this law becomes effective. Um, because they don't want to work for uh, under the terms of, of that law. And you're seeing also declines in um, people who actually want to be going into this health field because they, they don't want to work under such a regulated system. They, and, and I think if you look at those statistics, you'll see that I'm, I'm correct about that. Just one more second. Uh, just to follow up on that, uh, but aren't people still coming into the field? Are people still doing it? Of course. Younger, I, I certainly yes. agree that people are leaving uh, for, for perhaps some of the reasons that you mentioned, uh, in the national and any of uh, But um, people are still coming in and still providing the services, which might include not only people in our own nation, but people from other nations, uh, because they brought their productivity and lower wage rates to us, which allows us all to benefit from that. The answer to your question is absolutely yes. Um, however, uh, what you're going to have is fewer doctors in the system. Um, you're going to have a higher cost than would be um, in a, there would be in a, in a private free enterprise system, which we do not have now and have not had since 1932. And um, I think that you would actually see lower costs if you were to allow that free market system to exist, which it hasn't. Um, and I think that by reducing the number of physicians and other medical tech, uh, care providers in the system, you're making waiting times longer. You're reducing the quality of care because the people um, who might be willing to do it for less might not be as qualified. They're just going to be such a shortage that they might be pushed through um, and, you know, and, and licensed. So I'm... That, those are my concerns with, yes, there still will be doctors, but will there be lines? Will there be waiting lists? Will there be, dare I say, death panels? <laughs> um, and we all know what that means. It means deciding whether someone deserves, uh, is, is going to get the care that they need at an age that's, you know, considered old enough and you've lived long enough, so we're not going to give you this, this care that you need, even though it would preserve your life another six years. My problem is that this law makes government the arbiter of, of whether someone's life is valuable. And my principle is that everyone's life is valuable uh, until God, in my opinion, decides to take them. <laughs> thank you. So you no know, further questions, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you.